I just want to thank the Lord once again to have given me this opportunity to be with us and uh, to look into his word. Uh, I want to look into the basis of our salvation, the basis of our salvation. And uh, this is uh, some kind of a series, but uh, uh, because this is uh, not a series on this channel, I'll just speak from some point and uh, pray that the Lord will help us to uh, catch up with it. The, the story is uh, the story of Minneapolis, 1888, uh, just revisiting it uh, at such a time as this, when uh, we are seeing that uh, the prophecies that uh, have, we have been given in the word of God are being fulfilled in our times. And we are living in such a time when uh, God is calling us to open uh, our spiritual eyes and even the physical eyes to be able to behold the things that are happening uh, amongst us. And so the issue of uh, 1888, the history, we know it. And um, looking at what happened at that time and what is happening at this time, the question that we have to ask ourselves, why is it that after this long time, Christ has not come and what is he expecting us to do or to accept so as he may do the final work and usher us into his kingdom? Uh, looking at the backdrop of uh, 1888, just um, before the death of uh, James White in 1881, we had James White come up with a tree in 1876 that... Um, was an illustration of uh, how human beings are saved. When you look at the tree closely, you will see the tree. And then um, we have the altar of burnt offering. And then we have the sinners coming. And uh, just uh, in front of the tree, we have the altar of burnt offering. And then on the tree, they are hanging uh, the Ten Commandments or the law of God. Then after that, you have Christ on the cross on some far right. And so uh, uh, this is uh, the tree that uh, James White had in 1876 as the basis of salvation, how man is accepted before God. And uh, there is uh, a statement that uh, E.G. White made uh, during uh, uh, the 1890s that uh, as a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law. And uh, this is a statement from Review and Herald, 11 3, uh, 1890. She, she had been penning such a statements prior to this time, but uh, this uh, was a very important statement. There came E. J. Wagona and Etty Jones, whom we understand from uh, testimonies to ministers and gospel workers that uh, God sent them with a precious message to the church to prepare them for the end time events. For we also understand that around the times of 1880s leading up to 1888, while events were happening and uh, the political arena was ready for the chapter in Revelation, that is uh, Revelation chapter 13, Everything was ready, but the church was not ready. And so God sent E.J. Wagoner and Etty Jones so that they may bring a message that will bring uh, a revival and a reformation so that the people of God may be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the tree that Wagoner, when uh, he was sitting in the camp meeting on one gloomy uh, 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 afternoon, he was able to see Jesus Christ crucified uh, on the cross and he did not see anything else apart from Christ and the cross. He did not see the law or anything else. He did not uh, uh, see the Ten Commandments. And uh, that is when uh, he came up with the message of righteousness by faith. Uh, e. G., uh, Ellen White had said that uh, she had been preaching 
the message for the last 45 years, but uh, no one was really getting it. But uh, when uh, E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones presented it, presented it, all the fiber of her being said amen. And so this is the tree uh, that Wagoner saw or came up with opposed or uh, different from what uh, James White had had in 1876. And so she wrote from Europe, a revival of true goldness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs in review and herald uh, that is uh, on third uh, second of uh, March in 1887 uh, E.G. White writing uh, from Europe and uh, question sanctification was seen as the basis of salvation this, this is this were the issues back then when the law was being preached and uh, uh, the work of Christ in justification was seen primarily in regard to our sins of the past. Now, this, this can get into a theological bend, but uh, I like uh, you to persevere a little bit as we look at these issues. The issue we are really looking into is what is the basis of our salvation? Prior to 1887, 1886, 1887, before Wagner and John started preaching their messages, the denomination as a whole or the tenor of the denomination was that sanctification was seen as the basis of salvation. And uh, when we talk about sanctification, what is sanctification? Actually, sanctification in its primary meaning is being set apart, but also it is justification experience. That is uh, the uh, imparted righteousness of Jesus Christ, not the imputed one. The imparted one is where actually the Holy Spirit is working on your heart and the reformation is taking place. There are changes which are taking place, uh, unlike uh, the imputed righteousness, which actually we are counted righteous uh, on the basis of what Christ has accomplished and not what we are uh, um, uh, developing into or the grace working in our lives. And um, in... Uh, Fundamental Principles in uh, Science of the Time, June 4, 1874. Uh, this is what we had science in the Science of the Time. As all have violated God's law and cannot of themselves render obedience to his just requirements, we are dependent on Christ, first for justification from our past offenses, and secondly for grace whereby to render accept acceptable obedience to his holy law in time to come and so this is the message that actually uh et jones and uh ej wagon i wanted to revive and bring it so clearly before the de denomination that the basis of our salvation the whole uh issue send us upon what christ has done on the cross and um uh the perfect righteousness which is needed uh, uh from man actually is the righteousness that Christ has procured for us. For we shall see in some statements that uh, actually our righteousness cannot match the perfection of the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. I say that cautiously, knowing that uh, uh, maybe there can be an objection on that, which we can look into also. Again, in A.G. Um, Daniels, in Christ Our Righteousness, page 6, paragraph 1, this is what he had to say. The word of God clearly portrays the way of righteousness by faith. The writings of the spirit of prophecy greatly amplify and elucidate the subject. In our blindness and dullness of heart, we have wandered far out of the way and far and for many years have been failing to appropriate this sublime truth. But all the while, our great leader has been calling his people to come into line on this great fundamental of the gospel, receiving by faith the imputed righteousness of Christ for sins that are past and the imparted righteousness of Christ for revealing the divine nature in human flesh. Again, this is what we're going to head. This is the view that we're going to head. Man's obedience can never satisfy God's law. And number two, Christ imputed righteousness alone is the basis of our acceptance by God. 
And number three, we constantly need the covering of Christ's righteousness, not just for our past sin, but actually as man continues grow, growing in uh, Christ, we have what we call the sins of omission, the sins of ignorance, things that people may do thinking that it is righteousness, but it's not righteousness. And how is that accounted for? It is what Christ has done on Calvary. And am I saying that uh, we cannot be perfect? No, we can be perfect, but in Christ, our life is hid in Christ. And as we offer what we have to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, actually, Christ's righteousness is, is mingled uh, 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 with our life that we give, and then we are accepted before the Father, not on the basis that there can be anything in our merit that can be presented before the Father and accepted, but what Christ has done and is doing in us. And so E.J. Wagona in Christ and his righteousness, let the reader try to picture the sin. Here stands the law as the swift witness against the sinner. It cannot change and it will not call a sinner a righteous man. The convicted sinner tries again and again to obtain righteousness from the law, but it resists all his advances. It cannot be bribed by any amount of penance or professedly good deeds, but here stands Christ full of grace as well as of truth calling the sinner to him. He continues to say, at last, the sinner, weary of the vain struggle to get righteousness from the law, listens to the voice of Christ and flees to his outstretched arms. Hiding in Christ, he is covered with his righteousness. And now behold, he has obtained through faith in Christ that for which he has been vainly striving. He has the righteousness which the law requires. And it is the genuine article because he obtained it from the source of righteousness, from the very light, from the very place when the law came. And uh, on this basis, that is why we are told, let your light shine so that the men may give glory to the Father in Matthew chapter 5, 14. And this light that we let shine, it is just a reflection of the true light, which is Jesus Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We cannot manufacture righteousness. We have to receive from Christ. No wonder we have the fruit of the spirit, which is not our spirit, but the spirit of Christ in us. And then when we let it shine, actually, we are letting Christ shine and not our own righteousness, which we are trying to manufacture. In the book of Psalms, chapter or the division of Psalms 32, verses 1 and 2, 5 and 8 and 11, this is what we read. This is David, actually, after he had sinned with Bathsheba. He says, Blessed is his whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Uh, you, you can see the words that actually... Uh, David uses that uh, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guide. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will uh, confess my transgression unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I'll guide thee with mine eye. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy all ye that are upright in heart. And in Hebrews 11, 6, we are told, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Man must stop looking unto himself and what he can produce and look at Jesus Christ who can produce everything that God will be uh, satisfied with. We have a habit of having a checklist and looking at what have we accomplished, what have we failed. But uh, then 
we drift into another extreme that we think that righteousness is the balancing of the good deeds we have and the wrong things we have. And so if our goodness outweighs the bad things we have done, we see ourselves uh, in a better position to be accepted before the Lord uh, uh, than a person who have so much wrongs and have some little goodness. And this is the problems that the church was facing back in 1880s, thinking that uh, with uh, some few things they have accomplished uh, to do that uh, they are acceptable before the Lord. And so uh, it was like a balance of what is uh, the, 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 the wrong things that they have done and the good things they have done. This is the issue that goes on and on in our lives trying to balance righteousness by faith with the right things we have done and the wrong things we have done. And when we see that uh, actually our right things are out outweighing the wrong things, we see that uh, we are nearer to God than ever before. But then God does not look at things like that. He looks at the heart, which actually is uh, longing for Christ and seeking him and uh, not putting merit on the works that they are doing, but putting the merit on what Christ has accomplished. In Luke chapter 17, verse 10, we read that, So likewise ye, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. And uh, you will find that uh, in one of the statements, we are told that, um, if we could gather all the good things that uh, these holy men have done and um, bring it before the gates of heaven as a basis of our having an access to heaven, then the angels will call that treason. But um, this is what we always do. When we look at others, we say, look at that person, how bad they are. And... Uh, they, they, they can't be compared to me because I don't do the things that they do, while actually we even don't know the struggles that people are going through. And so when we have done all we have been commanded to do, all we have to do is say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. And uh, that should not be a basis of uh, our acceptance in heaven. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, we are told, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And so when I, I look at this verse, I find it uh, so sublime in the issue of righteousness by faith. What is our inheritance, our inheritance is the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of who? The Holy Spirit of God, given unto us through his Son, according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because he has sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. It is the Spirit of this Son that actually we are given as a basis or as our inheritance, as a basis of our salvation, our inheritance. And that is why we are told that now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If we are not having the spirit of Christ, then even we cannot reproduce the righteousness that is needed for our salvation. And so it is the spirit of Christ that we are given that is, is, that is our inheritance. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, we are told, Know ye not that, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, it is interesting that uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, we are told that in the uh, God had prepared a body for Jesus Christ. And why had God prepared a body for Jesus Christ? So that the eternal spirit may be able to dwell in the temple of flesh, and that body not do the will, its will, but it does the will of the Father, which is in heaven. We'll find that um, even in our salvation, we are even in Christ, uh, we are told that uh, the righteousness that Christ had is the righteousness of the Father. Uh, I think that uh, should be in the book of uh, uh, Philippians, uh, chapter three, 
let me see if uh, I can be able. Yes, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, we read that, uh, And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So the righteousness that is in Christ is the righteousness of God. In which way, in the body that God had prepared for his son, he gave that eternal spirit so that uh, the son may be able to reproduce the righteousness of God. But if he were left on his own, then from what we see in the garden of Eden, when he is praying, not my will, but thy will be done. So Christ could have had his own will, which could have not been the will of the father. But because he had the spirit of God in him, he could only do the will of God. And we can have an access to that by having Christ in us, the hope of glory, the basis of our salvation. It is having this spirit of Christ in us, working to will and to do of his own pleasure. Letters and Manuscript, Volume 3, Letter 46, 1879. Uh, Look at what we are told on the issue of righteousness by faith. Oh, the Christians' last days may be fragrant because the beams of the sun of righteousness shine through the life, diffusing a perpetual fragrance. Oh, what reason have we for joy that our Redeemer poured out his precious blood on the cross as an atonement for sin, and by his obedience to death brought in everlasting righteousness? You know that today he is at the Father's right hand, a prince of life, a savior. There is no other name wherein you can trust your eternal interest, but in Christ you may really rely fully implicitly. Christ has been loved by you, although your faith has sometimes been feeble and your prospects confused, but Jesus is your savior. He does not save you because you are perfect, but because you need him and in your imperfection have trusted in him. Jesus loves you, my precious child. And we can say amen to all this, that uh, Christ covers our imperfection, that he supplies where we are weak, that his strength may be made perfect. If we were strong enough, then we will not need Christ. But because we are weak, he supplies for that weakness. Does that mean that he gives us the license to continue sinning so that the grace may abound? That is not the case. But in our feeble efforts to uh, do that, that which is his will and to understand what he is uh, uh, asking us to do, actually he becomes our righteousness. And even though our prospects sometimes may be confused, he loves us. And he doesn't cast us away, but actually continues strengthening us so that we may not despair. In John 6, 63, he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so as we receive his words, actually he gives us this uh, 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 divine power to be able to continue are uh, uh, trusting in him that he will be able to accomplish that which he has started in our lives, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises uh, that by this ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4. In Colossians 1, 27, to, him God, to whom God will make known that is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, in uh, Review and Herald, December 15, 1891, paragraph 9, we are told that uh, the gospel of Christ becomes a personality. Now, that is interesting to say that the gospel of Christ becomes a personality. As we receive his words of truth, as we receive his spirit, then that spirit, uh, Christ, is formed within the hope of glory as we receive his words of instruction. 
uh, Christ is formed within the hope of glory. And that is the distinct personality of the Holy Spirit in us in a, 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 a different nature, uh, in, in a distinct nature, I mean, not a different nature, but a distinct nature. Christ is formed within the hope of glory. And so when the gospel of Christ is received by faith, it becomes a personality. And that personality is the personality of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1, 54, verses 17, Jeremiah 23, 6, 6, we read, and this is in Mount of Blessing 18.2, not by painful struggles or wearisome toil, not by gift or sacrifice is righteousness obtained, but it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, without money and without price. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Again, Jesus dwelling in our hearts will make the difference. But that which God required of Adam in paradise before the fall, he requires in this age of the world from those who will follow him. Perfect obedience to his law. But righteousness without a blemish can only be obtained through the imputed righteousness of Christ. This is amazing. It is not imparted righteousness that uh, produces righteousness without blemish. And we understand imparted righteousness is the sanctification, where actually we continue growing in grace and in the will of God. But we are told righteousness without blemish is obtained through the imputed righteousness of Christ. And uh, imputed righteousness is the righteousness a sinner is given on his account that which Christ accomplished on Calvary. And as um, we continue in that, actually Christ makes us acceptable before his Father. The Lord is ready to do large things for all those who believe. Jesus longs to quicken our hearts with helpful spiritual life. Jesus dwelling in the soul, purifying and ennobling all our faculties, guiding us into all truth, makes us a bright and shining light unto the world. Then let not this light burn dim. Moment by moment, we need to live looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And we are told that as we behold him, we become. We become just like him as we continue beholding him. In um, letter 1E, 1890, just these are extracts from 1888 messages. Righteousness of Christ imputed to men means holiness, uprightness, purity. Unless Christ's righteousness was imputed to us, we could not have acceptable repentance. The righteousness dwelling in us by faith consists of love, forbearance, meekness, and all the Christian virtues. Here, the righteousness of Christ is laid hold of and becomes a part of our being. All who have this righteousness will work the works of God. So uh, if you wanted the foundation of righteousness by faith, then you will start on righteousness imputed, not righteousness imparted. Because uh, it is... It is the platform on which actually the imparted righteousness builds on. That is, Christ's imputed righteousness is the foundation, is the platform that imparted righteousness finds it is stepping stone. In Psalms 116, verses 12, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefit toward me? Look at what David is saying again. I'll take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his, all his people. O Lord, truly I am thy servant, I am thy servant and the son of thine hindmaid. Thou hast loosened my bones, I'll offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, Praise ye the Lord. And so you find that um, uh, what David is concerned with most is thanking the Lord for what he has done for him. And the 
the the offerings of thanksgiving the sacrifice of thanksgiving sometimes we think that when we come with our tithes when we come with our offering and when we come with all these monies before the lord they, we we can convince him to accept us it can be part of our righteousness but um there are people in the world who knows how to give more than we know how to give and uh, um what we give is just an attitude of gratitude that God has done something for us and he has procured salvation for us. But uh, then it cannot be counted as per se that uh, the more you give, the more you are accepted before the Lord. Do we have not to give? We have to give because it's a sign of gratitude that we have received this salvation which has been procured for us freely as a gift. In Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly to rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. And talking about um, uh, Christ uh, decking or uh, adorning the bride with the garments or the robe of righteousness. Think about it in a wedding model that a man provides for the wedding garment for the bride or the wife to be. But then you have to ask a man, why did you buy your wife to be a garment? She is not your wife yet. And you don't know if she may end up being your wife. Why have you bought uh, your wife to be a wedding garment? And uh, it will be interesting to hear the answers. But if we understand salvation and how family setup actually corresponds with salvation, we will we will uh, we will um, get uh, uh, or we will have an answer that the reason why a man actually buys the woman a wedding garment, even though they have not gotten married, is that uh, uh, he is putting all trust that uh, this woman, although uh, he doesn't know her that well and he hadn't lived with her, still he can do that which is good for her and it be a basis of their love rather than the woman giving back uh, or um, providing anything that will make the man be impressed uh, to give her the wedding garment. But when the woman receives this wedding garment to be worn on the wedding day, does she go about soiling it because she received it freely and the money is so good? That is not what she does. She keeps it safely and spotted, knowing that she was loved before even she showed the love and the man chose her before even she chose him. And so this is how we respond to the gift of salvation. Christ loved us before we even did anything good. And we can only reciprocate uh, um, by um, uh, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice unto him. In 1888 messages, a book that every Seventh-day Adventist should, be, uh, should read and it should be in our circles, we are told, page 18, uh, 816 paragraph 1, I ask, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers, all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclination, all the pardon of sins in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith, which is also the gift of God. If you will gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man, and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition will be rejected as treason. Standing in the presence of their creator and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshrouds his person, they are looking upon the Lamb of God given from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation, to be rejected of sinful men, to be despised, to be crucified, who can measure the infinity of the sacrifice. 
and then Christ and his righteousness, page 57, paragraph 2. E.J. Wagon has this to say, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off will not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house, justify rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And this is the danger that uh, we find ourselves in, that after doing some few things which are commendable in the sights of men and are um, seen as um, a good deeds that uh, a church member should be doing, we start exalting ourselves and thinking that um, these are the things that makes a person be accepted before God. But um, as we are seeing, this thing was so elusive back in 1888 that when uh, Wagner and John started presenting it, it seemed that they were doing away with the law or the works of uh, the law. It is not for our goodness, Christ and his righteousness, page 68, paragraph 2. E.J. Wagner continues, It is not for our goodness that he loves us, but because of our need. He receives us, not for the sake of anything that he sees in us, but for his own sake and for what he knows that his divine power <clears throat> can make us, can make of us. It is only when we realize the wonderful exaltation and holiness of God and the fact that he comes to us in our sinful and degraded condition to adopt us into his family that we can appreciate the force of the apostles' exclamation, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be clothed, called the sons of God. <clears throat> 1 John 3, 1. Everyone upon whom this honor has been bestowed will purify himself even as he is pure. In page 69, paragraph 1, he says, this is Wagona, God does not adopt us as his children because we are good, but in order that he may make us good. Says Paul, God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loves us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ by grace he has saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding richness, riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Ephesians, 4, Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 7. And then he adds, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of our works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before then that we should walk in them. Verses 8 and 10. This passage shows that God loved us while we were yet dead in sins. He gives us his spirit to make us alive in Christ. And the same spirit marks our adoption into the divine family. And he thus adopts us <clears throat> that as new creatures in Christ, we may do the good works which God has ordained us. I want us to see this first line. God does not adopt us as his children because we are good, but in order that he may make us good. And um, when you look at the message of um, the return of the fourth angel's message in uh, Revelation 18, we are told that um, God calls the people in Babylon, my people, before they come out of Babylon. Does uh, he await them to be righteous before he says my people? No, he calls them my people before they come out of Babylon. And so the basis of their salvation is not what they have done first, but what Christ has done first on Calvary, that is what makes them uh, be called by God, my people. And then when they are called out of Babylon, then he gives them the power to continue in righteousness, his own righteousness. A.G. Daniels in, in uh, 1941 in uh, Christ Our Righteousness, page 67, 
when the sinner believes that Christ is his personal savior, then according to his unfailing promises, God pardons his sin and justifies him freely. The repentant soul realizes that his justification comes because Christ as his substitute and surety has died for him as his atonement and righteousness. Again, he says in page um, 104, paragraph 2, this is A.G. Daniels. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus of Christ. And this is the messages that we should be hearing at such a time as this, so that men may stop thinking that they have reached to a certain stature which makes them be accepted before God. As long as we are still living in this world, we should continue looking unto Jesus Christ and by faith uh, uh, acknowledging his imputed righteousness upon us, which propels us to continue in imparted uh, righteousness. In uh, Christ Our Righteousness, page 6.1, the word of God clearly portrays the way of righteousness by faith. The writings of the spirit of prophecy greatly amplifies and elucidate the subject. And we are told receiving by faith the imputed righteousness of Christ for sins that are past and the imparted righteousness of Christ for revealing the divine nature in human flesh. What if today you accepted Christ and died? Will you have imparted righteousness? You will only be having imputed righteousness and that will be the basis for your salvation. That will be the basis of your resurrection. Not what you could have done thereafter. God sees what could have been uh, before we even do it. And so if you receive Christ today in truth, only the imputed righteousness of Christ covers you and that is good enough for your resurrection. Not saying that if you live on, then you have to live a careless life, which is opposite to the life of Jesus Christ, and then you are accepted. But perfect righteousness is the imputed righteousness of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, in in uh, in uh, Glad Tidings, page eighty-one, E.J. E. Wagner says. Let no professed Christian take counsel of his own imperfections and say that it is impossible for a Christian to live a sinless life. It is impossible for a true Christian, one who has full faith, to live any other kind of life. And that is an amazing statement. If you have Christ, you cannot live another life, but live the life of Jesus Christ. That is what Wagner is saying. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 2. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Therefore, uh, abide in him. And uh, it gets interesting. Again, we are told in Glad Tidings, page 132, it is so rare for men to do anything without expecting an equivalent that theologians have taken it for granted that it is the same with God. So they begin their dissertations on God's covenant with the statement that a covenant is a mutual agreement between two or more persons to do or refrain from doing certain things. But God does not make bargains with men because he knows that they could not fulfill their part. After the flood, God made a covenant with every beast of the earth and with every fall but the beasts and the birds did not promise anything in return. Genesis 9, 9 to 16. They simply received the favor at the hand of God. That is all we can do. God promises everything that we need and more than we can ask or think as a gift. We give him ourselves, that is nothing, and he gives us himself, that is everything. That which makes us all the trouble is that even when men are willing to recognize the Lord at all, they want to make bargains with him. They want it to be a mutual affair, a transaction in which they will be considered as on a par with God. But whoever deals with God must deal with him on his own terms. That is on basis of fact that we have nothing and are nothing and he has everything 
and is everything and gives everything. Amen. General Conference Bulletin, as we bring this to an end, we need to settle every one of us, whether we are out of the Church of Rome or not. There are great many that have got the marks yet, but I am persuaded of this, that every soul which is here tonight desires to know the way of truth and righteousness. The congregation says amen, and that there is no one here who is unconsciously clinging to the dogmas of the papacy who does not desire to be freed from them. And um, what is the dogmas of, of uh, the papacy? The reason God sends the message of righteousness by faith is to counter the message of Rome that uh, through penance, through our works, we are acceptable before God. And that is why even the mark of the beast is based on righteousness by works because men cannot believe that God will do what he has promised to do during the time of trouble. And so they try to do anything that can make them survive at that period because they have not come fully out of Rome. But we are being told, flee out of Babylon. There is no salvation in Babylon. We have to be sure that no particle of Rome is remaining in us as we go on to sound the loud cry of the third angel's message. In MS 48, 1891, paragraph 52, this quote has ever impressed me uh, when I look at the issue of righteousness by faith. We are told, it is not your spirit that is going into heaven, it is Christ's spirit. Will you have it? Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear by my voice, and open the door. I'll come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Then I ask, how is it that so many of you are saying you do not know whether you are accepted of God or not, that you want to find Jesus? Don't you know whether you have opened the door? Don't you know whether you have invited him in? If you have not, invite him now. Don't wait a moment, open the door and let Jesus in. It is not your spirit that is going into heaven. It is Christ's spirit. Think about that for a moment, that um, our spirit is so carnal that uh, it cannot be accepted in heaven unless we receive the spirit of Christ and we receive his divine nature, then there's nothing that can be accepted of us. So it is the spirit of Christ, which is a promise, an honest promise of inheritance that is going to heaven. And uh, we may not unpack all that, but uh, uh, as we are given the spirit of Christ, it produces the fruit of the spirit. Our own spirit cannot produce the spirit, the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So A.G. Daniels goes on to say, if the article of justification be once lost, then is all true Christian doctrine lost. He then that strayed from the, this Christian righteousness must need fall into the righteousness of the law. That is to say, when he hath lost Christ, he must fall into the confidence of his own works. For if we neglect the article of justification, we lose it altogether. Therefore, most necessarily, it is chiefly and above all things that we teach and repeat this article continually. Yea, though we learn it and understand it well, yet it is there none that taketh hold of it perfectly, or believeth it with his heart. Therefore I fear lest this doctrine will be defaced, defaced and darkened again when we are dead. For the world must be replenished with horrible darkness and errors before the latter day come. And uh, he is quoting Luther on Galatians. So you ask, where is the law in all this then? And Sister White will tell you, let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law until we get as dry as the hills of Gilboa without dew or rain. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. May God help us that our eyes may be anointed with eyesal, that we may see. God helping us, we will draw nigh to him. And he says he will draw nigh to us. Do we believe? Will we come in God's appointed way? May the Lord help us and enlighten us that we may go forth from this place as they went forth to proclaim the truth after the day of Pentecost and there were souls converted they could not resist the testimony. And so, uh, but that which God requires of Adam in paradise before the fall, he requires in this age of the world from those who follow him, perfect obedience to his law, but righteousness without blemish can only be obtained through the imputed righteousness of Christ. If we start on that foundation as the basis of our salvation and not how would we have been then we will have the genuine article of righteousness by faith. And so 
the reaction to the listeners of 1888 messages as I go to the last slide, some accepted the message and supported Wagona, E.G. White, Willie White, Heskel, Wilcox, ETC. Some rejected the message led by Uriah Smith, J.H. Morrison, Conradi, and the Etal. The majority was undecided. They did not know what to believe. And so we, I ask ourselves as I finish this, if um, the 1888 messages was to be accepted by the delegates and go to the churches, and yet here we had a people who accepted it, others rejected it, and majority of them went from that meeting not knowing what to bring to the churches, how could a revival and a reformation be brought into the churches to usher in the last day events when a people who attended the meeting did not have a clue of what should be told to the church members so that they may react on the message itself. It is today, there are many sounds, there are many messages, but it seems as if we were in 1888 again, where we don't understand what we should bring to the churches so that a revival of true goldness may happen among us and the third, the fourth angel may return and we may be able to send the message of uh, 1888. My prayer is this, that um, how that the people of God may come back and study this message once again. And instead of having different voices speaking different things, we may have the genuine article and bring it to the members of the churches so that they may understand what is required of them at this moment and be able to sound the trumpet with a certain sound. Unless we come to an understanding of righteousness by faith and the basis of the foundation of the message, then we shall have voices uh, in different trumpets sounding, but without a certain note. And then the people of God will not get prepared for the return of the fourth angel's message. And when the messages return, you will find that many will be opposed to it because they will think it's something dangerous and taking away from them something when actually it will be a repetition of the same message in a louder voice and in a very clear, distinct manner. And um, uh, it will cause many to be lost because they have not been given the message as it should be given. And so may the Lord be with us. Uh, I pray that um, uh, the few, with the few remarks or the many remarks that um, we may come to an understanding of uh, the basis of our salvation and pray that the Lord will help us get the genuine article of righteousness by faith than uh, 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 seek an equivalent to God when we cannot give anything to God, but we can only receive everything from God. May the Lord bless us. Shall we close with a word of, of prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Above all things, we know that you love us and uh, you want us to look just like you. And we know that uh, our feeble efforts, Lord, can be strengthened by the righteousness of thy son. And uh, we pray that we may clasp the hand of Jesus Christ, look unto him, and uh, stop looking at ourselves. And we know that as we look unto thee and uh, acknowledge that you are a reward of them that seek you diligently, the Lord, at the end of the day, we shall be saved. Not because of the many things we have done which are right, but because, Lord, you have seen it fit to cover us with the robe of righteousness, not in sin, but imputing on us the righteousness of thy son. And so thank you for your people. We pray that you may open our hearts to receive the true article of justification by faith. Thy will be done and continue guiding us in these end times as we see prophecies being fulfilled, Lord. May we look up for our redemption draweth nigh. May we see the beauty of Jesus Christ and be lost to all the earthly things. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.